when I was in the Army, before I went into the United States Army Chorus, in basic training, I was a squad leader, and the whenever whenever you're paid, say in a in a, a, a squad or a company, uh, one has to go in and salute the pay officer, and request uh, payment. And one day, I went in and saluted the lieutenant, and uh, he was there with the the master sergeant. Both of them were from Texas. Both were white. And there's always, the pay officer always has a pistol, a 45, on the desk, uh, just in case someone wants to make off <laughs> with more money than they're supposed to get, I suppose. But when I saluted and stated my name, uh, this lieutenant put his foot up on the desk and said in his Texas drawl, Shirley, what would you do if I took this gun? And he reached out and picked up his pistol, which is loaded, and pointed it at me. And I looked at him and I said, sir, there's not much that I could do. I don't know what he's expecting me to do, maybe to, oh, Lord, Lord, don't shoot me, please. No, no. I said, there's not that much, I, I, there's not anything that I could do. And he looked at me and he said, no. put his gun down, paid me. I saluted and went out. That was his problem, not mine. So there were moments, yes, as a black person that I've experienced negativity on the part of ignorant people, but I have, my, my faith has helped me to deal with that without getting completely bent out of shape. So um, there's lots of judgments based upon how I look um, and the intersectionality of that. I'm a female, I'm a female of color. I'm a female of color from the inner city. I'm a female of color from the inner city of Detroit. I'm a female of color from the inner city of Detroit in the poorest zip code. So I can just keep going and going and going. Um, so all of that, um, people make assumptions as soon as they see me. Uh, however, that doesn't mean that's how I'm going to show up, though that is a part of me and it's a part of my story. That doesn't also mean that I'm not articulate. It doesn't also mean that I was not, you know, summa cum laude. It does not also mean that I received a full academic scholarship for being salutatorian. Uh, doesn't, you know, equate for all of the merits. It only equates for the demerits. As a result, uh, I was marginalized often, um, whether it was by not calling on me because they didn't think I had the right answer or just not even seeing me at the board table. Uh, but nonetheless, you still show up, you still rise, and you still shine because you got the gifts, you got the talent, you got the knowledge. It's only so long someone can pause you and mute you until you just naturally shine through for better recommendations. And in the end, equity, justice, which is what I do in my work, shows up and it prevails. That's said so well, and I can jump in there. So, Kendall, when I think about the impact of my identity in my pursuit, I can't help but to think about something that happened even just recently. So this weekend, we were watching in disbelief that someone, a white man, uh, would tell a white woman who is going to be our future first lady of the United States of America that she shouldn't use the term doctor in front of her name, even though she earned it by completing a doctorate degree. When I think about how many times that's happened to me, where people have not referred to me by doctor, or uh, th this one story that I, I tell quite um, a bit, I, when I took my first job, someone was trying to guess what I was doing there. And they said, oh, are you a secretary? No. Janitor? No. Undergrad? Mm -hmm. No. Master's student? No. Docs they, and they literally went through every stage and I left them and I, was, I said no to everything. So then when they finally asked what I was doing, I said, oh, I'm an assistant professor. This person literally said, non-tenure track. So wow. it, takes, it takes more syllables to say <clears throat> non-tenure track than either tenure track or, oh, are you pursuing ten tenure? Like there are a number of ways to ask that, but they assumed non-tenure track. And after I corrected them and said no tenure track, they were blown away because I was so young is what they said. 
but never at any point have um, my male or white male colleagues in particular been asked questions like that or been made um, a, a, an assumption of in such that way that they would not be pursuing the highest level of a certain job. Uh, white males constantly saying, well, maybe you should just drop out the program if you don't know what you're doing, like maybe this isn't the right fit for you. Um, and I think the best response to that is- I understand that that's probably what they felt comfortable saying out loud. Sure. But we know that there were some other unconscious biases because if it was another person who perhaps didn't look like you and however we you identify yourself as, they may not have started at secretary and janitor. Sure. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, unconscious implicit bias is everywhere. Have you ever witnessed someone being treated unfairly because of their racial or ethnic identity just been a witness to it in your position or just ever in life? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I think the first time I ever witnessed it was when I was in law school. It, I heard about it and it probably happened to me and I wasn't cognizant of it as a young person growing up in Detroit. The thing is about growing up in Detroit is that it's you're, you're sort of insulated as a minority because it's a majority black city. So you see black people all the time you hopefully are comfortable around black people. So when you get outside of the world or you step outside of the, you know, the 20, 30 mile radius that the city encompasses on all four sides, you are no longer the majority, you're the minority. And that happens when you go to places of higher education. We've got, you know, U of M, Michigan, Eastern, um, Western, like all the colleges, there are no historically black colleges in the state of Michigan. So every educational institution outside of what is considered majority black inside of Detroit is white. And so that's where my shock value came in when I went to a historically black college too. So my first like encounter with a majority white population was in graduate school, was in law school. And I was one of six black people out of a class of 225, I should say six minorities, because only five of us, four of us were black. Um, and I went to, when I was my first year of law school or going into my second year of law school, 9-11 happened. And we had a pretty, I think we had a substantial Middle Eastern population, student population on OSU's campus, but there were quite a few Muslim students that were at uh, OSU Law and of that Muslim student population, there were a few that were female and they wore the hijab um, and the traditional Muslim um, garments. And um, I remember after 9-11 happened, you know, we all were just in a collective shock. I mean, just, you, you did, we did not know what was going to happen to the world as we knew it. And uh, the law school is set up like a high school. We had lockers, we were on the edge of the campus. So, and it was by design because you really don't need to focus on anything else but your studies while you're there. So we had a cafeteria, we had our own library, we had, a lo had lockers, we had study lounges. We were encased in that one building. And I remember going to the locker area and it was a girl, um, who I became really good friends with, her name was Shama. Shama came to her locker and she was frozen. And I walked past and I was like, are you okay? And somebody had put all this graffiti over her locker. Now, mind you, and it's, it said the most horrific things about Muslim people calling her terrorists and towel head and you go back to where you came from. You, you know, it was the most derogatory stuff that I had ever seen in my life. And I'm like, I felt my, I was gutted because one, she didn't feel safe. And two, it was like, we are in a, this, whoever did this in her locker. And again, the campus is not open to the public. So whoever it was was somebody that had access to, or was a student in that law school. And in order to go to law school or any higher, to get any higher degree, you have to have a college education. These are college educated folks who are, had the audacity to feel comfortable enough to write something so horrific and racist on her locker and threaten her safety.
And be 